we have another episode with the A team here. This is this is a lot of fun to talk about some of the aspirational wineries around the world. We have we have now filmed at most of the properties from an eponymous family called the Rothschilds. And if you're a Som TV subscriber, you know that we made a, a basically a feature length documentary in the Vertical series on Lafitte Rothschild, where they opened up in 1945 and tell the whole whole history of the family. That's never been done before. And I want to be very clear. If you have not seen the Rothschild documentary on Som TV, you really should because it's one of a kind. The family is, um, they're, they're private, but they're also very busy and they don't do this kind of thing. And so when we filmed that, we were also in the process of filming down in Argentina for Cup of Salvation and a number of things that are coming on Som TV about Mendoza and Argentinian wine. And we filmed it a winery called Bodegas Caro. Well, joining me for this conversation today, I have Nicole McKay, who's the managing editor of the Som TV magazine, online magazine. And then I also have Jackson Myers, who heads production. He is the cinematographer for every film we do. He's an editor. He looks great in a plaid shirt. I don't know if you're watching the video, but this guy, he just got in from chopping wood outside. He looks beautiful. Um, this is basically, you're looking at, well, some of the core team at Som TV. And we just had a couple more wineries we had in film, but Nicole got back from Chile, like very recently, and filmed at a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous winery down there that the Rothschilds are major investors in. So I thought, why don't we have a conversation about this idea of these wineries and their global reach in the wine space for quality and perception? And so Nicole and Jackson, what I want to start off with is what do you what do you guys think is the overall perception of Rothschild, that name in the wine space? Obviously, you could go banking, you could go, I mean, Saskia herself is a documentarian and a writer, but we'll stick to wine. We'll stick in that space. What is the perception, Nicole? of the Rothschilds. I mean, the first word that comes to my mind is unattainable. You think of Bordeaux, you think of how the prestige that that carries. But then when you get into these other properties that they have a hand in, and it's very much attainable. And it is fascinating to see a family that is so renowned in French wine um, explore terroir and heritage and tradition in other parts of the world. Yeah. It's, is it, does it, does expensive come to mind? What, for Lafitte? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think even, even people with extreme means have not had it many, many, many times. You know, it's, it's a wine. I mean, Jackson, what about you? What is, what is the idea of Rothschild wine? I know you and I have been very lucky to drink. Yeah. Um, the, the, We've drink, we've have been fortunate enough to drink a few different versions of their wines from certainly from Lafitte. But I mean, to me, it's it's yeah, prestigious. You know, it's hard to get, almost impossible to get, and it goes back for hundreds of years. So there's that history behind it too. That and that's I think the part that drew us to it for our Som TV documentaries was all the history that's enveloped in these bottles of wine. So for, yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, you can't, you find a family that can do, that can talk about war, that can talk about commerce, that can talk about, I mean, you, I'm sure they wouldn't want to be called a dynasty. You know, that's not the kind of thing they want to be called. But whenever you have many, many generations that have been able to keep upping the ante and move forward, and now their wines, I mean, they have been a part of, God, I bet you if you were to go back 100 years, Lafitte was one of the most prestigious wines, but it was very obtainable. You know, I mean, if you were in London or something, it would be one of the wines on a list. I was watching, not to get dark here, but I was watching Schindler's List the other night. And there is an amazing scene where Liam Neeson's character goes in and he's, he's trying to buy a bottle of wine to impress these German officers. And Lafitte Rothschild and Domaine de la Romani Conti and those wines are on the list. And I dove really deep into would they actually have been on the list? And the answer is 100% they would have. Even during wartime in Paris, or in Poland, or in any of these places, those would have been the wines that you would see. And so, but over the course of the last hundred years, these wines have become something of another stature. And a lot of that does have to do with the amount that is out in the world. And some of it has to do with the fact that, that the global market opened up. I mean, China and Japan, and probably Malaysia, those three places, I mean, Taiwan as well, 
Hong Kong until it became part of China, those places drink a lot of high-end wine and they changed Bordeaux forever. And so now you're looking at a wine that probably could have cost $100 less and now is in many cases well over 1000 and in some cases well over that. So Lafitte is sort of a high watermark in both branding and also in quality. But we're also here to talk about these other wineries that they've invested in that we have both filmed at. Nicole, you were just at. And I think we'll talk about I think we'll talk about Argentina first. So, Jax, what I want to do is talk mm-hmm. about Bodegas Caro. So yeah. we went down to film Cup of Salvation in Argentina. And I can't wait for people to find out the reason why we <laughs> we filmed in the Middle East, um, you know, Italy. Argentina, all these different places, all for a very specific reason. But I'll give a little bit of a background on this this winery here. So Bodegas Caro is the culmination of two of the bigger, more important wine families in the world. That would be Catena and the Rothschilds. And so that name Caro is a combination of both their last names. And I remember, Jackson, when we went in to go film at this place, we were blown away by how much it looked like a domain on the left bank in the Medoc. Yeah. It didn't look like, cause we had been all over Mendoza top to bottom, you know, uh, high up in the altitude down low in the city. And this winery is right in the city. And so I should also give a, give a little bit to say that I don't know that it's the easiest thing to get appointments at these win- wineries, but they're not necessarily the expense level, their wines at least, that Lafitte is. So you get the quality and the same kind of making and they're in the same barrels. But, you know, in some cases they use different grapes. Like for instance, you'll find Malbec blended with Cab and other things down in the Bodegas Caro. Um, So if you do get a chance to go see these, Jackson, what will you see if we're talking about Bodegas Caro? So I think let's take it back a second and talk about Mendoza, which is where this Bodegas Caro is. And it is nothing like Bordeaux geographically, right? It's up against the Andes mountains. I think the town sits at 2,500 feet. Um, you feel like you're in Argentina because you are, and you feel like you're, you know, at a high altitude because you are. So you couldn't be too much further from Bordeaux as far as how it feels when you're there on the ground. But like you said, as soon as you see the exterior of the winery, it's like this, you know, big brick building that's sort of tucked away on a side street in the middle of the city. You go, okay, now I could be convinced I'm I'm in Bordeaux. And then when you step in, you're stepping into this beautiful wine bar. There's art on all the walls. You know, you keep going back. It's a really expansive room. Uh, And then at the very back of that top floor is a spiral staircase. And at this point, you're still kind of in Mendoza. But then as soon as you walk down that spiral staircase into the barrel room where they're aging their wines and oak barrels from the Lafitte Rothschild property, you're like, okay, now I'm officially in Bordeaux. You know, I'm officially there. (laughs) Uh, and it's you forget totally true. entirely that you're in Mendoza at that point. Um, it smells like Bordeaux. It smells like, you know, the wineries over there. And then, you know, the second you go back up and you have a glass of wine and you realize that they're going to, you know, have some live tango that night, you go, okay, I'm back in Mendoza. But I'm drinking this wine, which has this, you know, interesting juxt- juxtaposition of being half Bordeaux and half Argentinian. So, yeah, it's a really neat experience to see that. I found their wines to be very... You know, this sense of place, I always rail on the word terroir. I, I I find it to be very misused, overused, kind of as a marketing term. And But you do find when you're in places, especially when they're blending two different things like they did there with uh, Caro, it tastes, it very much tasted like a left bank Bordeaux to me. It really did. I think that especially their, their higher end label, uh, mm-hmm. I, I was blown away by what it tasted like and what it smelled like. And yet it does have Malbec. So you have this like very unique um, touch of the fruitiness is, is very different. It's got much more of a fruit character, but it's so refined. And so when we talk about these kind of like other wineries, I mean, I think people are familiar with like Opus one and the partnership Baron Rothschild did with Mondavi and made Opus one. And they tried to make a Bordeaux style. And now that's a, an incredibly expensive bottle of wine. It's on, you know, the most expensive oak you can get your hands on. But when you talk about these other wineries, they're going into a place like Argentina where the fine wine 
and I don't mean fine wine from a quality, I mean fine wine from a marketing standpoint, is in its nascence, meaning it goes back 30, 40 years probably that people were doing serious, serious blends and single variety stuff. And I'm not trying, you know, there are outliers that, that really have been doing this for a long time. But Argentina has had some political strife, all these things. So to be there, I mean, Jackson, remember we had probably, I mean, I think we probably drank two bottles a piece during, we filmed a, a tango. Yeah. We filmed uh, We filmed this whole tango thing. It's a rough life you and I have. Um, you it's know. A, a romantic yet rough life. Y- yeah. You were a tremendous date. I, I just want to say <laughs> to, to people listening that you were a very courteous date. Um, Thank you. <laughs> but, but. I, I, have, Nicole, have you ever had any of the? We'll get to Chile here in a second, but have you ever had any of the Argentinian wines that from, they've from done? Caro specifically? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've tried. It would have been ages ago, to be honest. Um, but you're, it, they do straddle the identity of Mendoza and Bordeaux, and you can sense that absolutely. Well, it's funny. We they are in the best of ways very, very, very in control of the branding and what they make. And I think that's really apparent in the fact that they use the same head at the winery in Mendoza that they do in Chile. Mm -hmm. Before we get to Chile, because I I do want to talk about that, then I want to juxtapose both of these wineries. And then I want to talk about kind of the global marketplace and how this fits in. Is it good for wine? Is it bad for wine? All of these kind of comments. But before I do, I want to say this episode of what you're listening to is brought to you in part by Vin Armor. So Vin Armor, part of the reason that I wanted to do this with this episode is we're talking about travel. We're talking about going places. And Vin Armor is this product I came upon. And Brian Hart, who's the owner, is a guy that desperately for years was trying to figure out a way, how can I bring bottles to and from remote places or just out to dinner if it's a really expensive thing and not break it? And for the longest time, I used bubble wrap. I mean, or I would just wrap bottles in my underwear or whatever when we travel. I mean, Jackson, how many, how many bottles? We had some broken bottles (laughs) along the way. Yeah, that's, that's, it's always good when your uh, boxers are all stained red because you just got back from Roberto Duero and tried to put 12 bottles of wine in your suitcase. But that's a memento, right? (laughs) Yeah. Not that, (laughs) not that you and I have ever uh, had that experience. Um, Never. But, but you know, so he created this thing and there are some products in the wine business that are what I would call necessary. And then there are some where you're like, I didn't know I needed that. And then there's some where you're like, this aerator is just what? Like, why is this a $50 thing that puts air in a glass of wine? And then there are things you discover like this Vin Armor where it's almost too well-made. You know, they make this thing. I think that after the apocalypse, the only thing left will be Walmart and maybe cockroaches and the Vin Armor because I don't understand why it is made so well. They do it with all this like this this incredible Scottish uh, linen, this like waxed linen and it's airtight. And even if it breaks, nothing comes out. So I know Christmas is coming and all of you who are wondering why I'm talking about this, this is going to be very high up on our list of gifts. You, you have to get the person in your wine life that you have no idea what to get. I stand by this product enormously. This guy went through decades of development on this and it is a huge product. I'm going to talk about it again, but I just for traveling, Nicole. I'm pretty sad that I didn't get you one. Yeah, I'm for sad when about you went that to Chile. <laughs> <laughs> no, because when you went to Chile, you know it's the kind of it thing 100% where it 100% would have come in handy. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 for sure. And so when we talk about the Chilean Rothschild wine, mm-hmm. let's. You just got back, yeah, and you had never been to Chile before. No, so Chile and Argentina have to be like the top, top, top of wine destination seekers. Talk to me overall, just really fast, about your perception of Chile and the wine regions, and then and then what you thought of the winery. Well, perception is new world. I think that's the first thing that comes to mind is that they're they've only been at it for a few decades, or at least in terms of the consumer's standpoint, and having Chilean wine available in their local wine shop, for instance. So you get this impression that they're still learning, or that they're just trying to figure out what their flagships might be. You went down there with that perception, you're saying? Yeah, from a consumer standpoint. But once you're there and and you realize the amount of tradition that goes into these wines, and it it's so homey, for lack of a better term. They're like the people that work there are a family. 
they've been working there for decades. And even in for Las Vascos, for instance, the um, head viticulturist, he took over his job from his father. So he's been roaming these vineyards his whole life. Um, and he's, I don't know, 40-ish, 50-ish. Um, so it just gives you a, a more realistic realization that these have, they've been around for a long time. There's a lot of tradition steeped in what they're doing um, and they're excellent wines. <laughs> so it, it did kind of change my perception a little bit seeing that. Well, I, so Jackson and I have had the pleasure of filming in the Maipo Valley down in Chile and, and we have, I should say for you subscribers, we have quite a bit coming on Chile and Argentina as well. But that's one thing that really does strike you. You know, you read that vines came to Chile in, you know, mid 1800s, early 1800s, depending on kind of what level of vines coming there we're talking about. And then you see the history and you realize, you know, look, they were under, they were under Pinochet for quite a long time. I mean, this is, this is a country that has had some strife and overcome it. Um, like every country really has these kind of stories. And so a lot of those wines from Chile really weren't, we couldn't get them. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a whole period in the 60s, 70s, 80s, where it was pretty tough to get a hold of Chilean wine and Argentinian wine too. I mean, this, these were wines that didn't get to us. So when you got down there and we're talking about this, uh, this Rothschild, you know, winery, they're a major investor, correct? It's not them completely behind the winery? For Los Vascos, yeah, they are yeah. in partnership with Santa Rita, uh, majority partnership, but um, yeah, that started in 1996. So they they came in from from Bordeaux in 1988, um, and they actually went into a partnership with the original owner, and then it transpired and evolved. And in 1996, it became a partnership between Lafitte and Santa Rita. So what does that do for a winery? Like if you're you're a winery and you're obviously making wine at a pretty high quality level to be on the radar of the Rothschilds, what does it do for a winery, do you think? For them to come in, put their brand on it, what happens? What do you what do you think is the the immediate outcome of that? I think I mean the focus on quality first and foremost. I mean, I think they came in and they planted some new vines and they kept their old vines because I know that their their flagship, their Grand Cuvée wine Ladi is made from 70-year-old vines, so they definitely kept those and and honed those. Um What are those grapes? Those flagship vines? Uh Cab, Syrah and Carmenere. Wow. Yeah. Um And are, are these Carmenere grapes that go back to like they thought it was Merlot? You know, the whole story with Carmen Air being extinct in Bordeaux and then probably sort of being that's a great rediscovered. Question. That yeah. was never, that never came up, but I, I would absolutely think so because they're, they're, they're yeah. that old for sure. Um, Incredible. But in terms of uh, what does that do in terms of like a global perspective? I mean, they're at now half a million cases annual production and 99% of that gets exported. So, like not much is staying in Chile from these guys specifically, which I was actually kind of blown away by. Um, but I think that's what the Lafitte name does is it gets access to other parts of the world. Well, I wonder too, when you, when you hear, I, I mean, I, I would like to talk to Saskia or a member of the family about this, but why, why and how they do their scouting? I want to get to what the wine was like. I mean, describe the winery first. Why don't Why don't you describe Los Vascos to us in, in a way that what is it like to walk in there? What does it feel like, and what is it? It's dreamy. Sort of <laughs> <laughs> it, it is unlike anything I could have imagined. Um, it is isolated. It's about three hours south of Santiago. Um, it is massive. Their estate is nearly nine thousand acres of land. About less wow. than two thousand of that is actually vineyards. Um, but it's sprawling and gorgeous. Like every sunrise, every sunset was orange and pinks and it was just absolutely beautiful. But when you, is this, is this because you're away from your kids for probably. a few days and you actually got to relax? <laughs> probably. <laughs> you're just imagining it as a mom who's like very busy. <laughs> well, and like the guest house, I mean, unfortunately it's not available to general tourists, but it's a pretty epic guest house only and it has a staff of a kitchen staff and a cleaning staff and like we got treated like royalty so yes there's probably some rose-colored imagery happening in my mind <laughs> but it's 
it's a, an, it's a, um, it's an ecosystem, their property. I mean, they have cows and sheep and horses and they have thousands of bees and they make their own honey. Like it's like, it's so, um, idealist almost in terms of what you want a winery to be. Um, but it's beautiful. It's, um, and then of course you have the mountains in the background, right? So that's a, that's a thing that runs through it. So the, in, the, the cool thing is it's the other side of the Andes. Yeah. So you're looking at them. If you're in Bodegas Caro in Mendoza, you're looking at one side. And then obviously in Chile, you're looking at the other side and Jackson and I have done that drive for a travel show we did, we did on PBS where you go from basically Argentina to Chile through the mountains. And I will tell you, it is harrowing. It is not yeah. the easiest situation. So, all right. They have, so they have the famous Rothschild barrels, mm -hmm. which in the episode on Lafitte, you get to see the whole process of, they have their own cooperage and, you know, they make their own barrels and they do that. And they always have, how the hell do you think they get those barrels and what percentage of the wine cost is actually that? <sighs> That's a big question. When we walked into the winery, I wasn't expecting to see the barrels and that probably seems a little um, like a funny thing to say, but you walk into the winery and you see the barrels from wall to wall and it's like, oh, we're on the other side of the world. How on earth did you get these hundreds and thousands of barrels in this winery here? It's mind blowing. And then, oh, it's, anyways, I'll digress a little bit about that, but um yeah, the cost associated with that is not small, I'm sure. Well, and barrels are not small either. So barrels are very different. Like it's, it is, uh, you either, basically you have to put them on a container ship and you are either going through the Panama Canal, which is probably the most likely scenario. They would take it across, go through the Panama Canal and then go south all the way down to Chile, or you would go around Cape Horn, which is probably one of the most dangerous places to take a boat. Um, it's a little different now than it was 150 years ago, but it is a wild, you know, Tierra del Fuego, storms, all the thing. And so I am, I am very, I wonder if there's an accountant or a CFO somewhere in the greater Rothschild's world that's like, can't we source barrels somewhere else and save some money? But there's this element of like, look, that's part of our quality control. So Talk about the wines. What did they taste like? What were the wines like and what grapes were in the bottle? The majority, I mean, it's it's majority Cabernet of everything they're, they're making, whether it's La D, which is the, the Grand Cuvée I was speaking about, or their varietal. They have their Cromass Grand Reserve wines, and then they have their varietal labeled wines. Of all of those, it's mostly Cab. Um, and they're delicious. I mean, fruit forward, well-balanced. Um, they had a few vintages, so I should say Lady is only made in exceptional vintages or good enough vintages. <laughs> There's only been three yeah. in the last couple of decades that haven't actually come to fruition. And of those, it's mostly 85% Cab, um, I want to say 10% Syrah and 5% Carmenere. So actually very little Carmenere considering these, these are Chilean wines, but they're leaning into the Bordeaux style aspect of it with, with that much cab. And I think in even there's been two vintages that they've ended up doing a hundred percent cab because either the Syrah didn't work out or the Carmenier just wasn't up to snuff, um, including the most recent. So 2021 Lady was a hundred percent cab. And I got to taste that out of barrel, um, which was an amazing experience in the Lady specific barrel room at the winery like they have their own separate barrel room for this particular wine so it's just like majestic is is all I can say these are um exceptional wines I mean they're going to be in barrel for I think 18 months total or aged 18 months maybe not that entire time in barrel um but tasting it out of the Lafitte barrel Again, just mind blowing. Like, how did I end up in that situation? <laughs> well, you ended up there because you know you you you're a you're a very writer lucky. for the Sam TV magazine. Yeah. <laughs> and you're a very very talented wine mind. I I I wonder too when when we talk about this stuff. I think price has to come into come into factor. So Jackson, when we talk about Bodegas Caro, we know what Lafitte costs. We understand yeah. that, and they do have they do have second and third labels. So it's not like you can't get a Bordeaux made by or ancillarily made by the family. But yeah. 
But I think what is what does Bodegas Caro cost? I can't remember. They since have a we few different. For it. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't pay for it, but they have a few different bottles, you know. And I think their their least expensive one is somewhere around thirty dollars. Their Petite Caro, and I think it's made in the same way as their you know more expensive bottle, the, the which I think is just called Caro, um, right? And that one I think is is twice the price of of the uh, Petite Caro, so you know seventy eighty bucks max. So compared to Lafitte. You know, it's a steal. And I will say the wine is delicious <laughs> and it definitely yeah. is wonderful with Argentinian cuisine. I mean, empanadas, the asado, any kind of meats. I was, I remember we got, we got to try it with a couple different types of food, but delicious food, delicious yeah. food together. Yeah. Yeah. I'll never forget. I uh, maxed out my Jenny Craig points on that, uh, <laughs> yeah. on that on, trip. On was, the first breakfast of the trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, yeah, that was the tricky one for me. The, uh, but the thought of getting a $30, $40 bottle of wine at that level, see, I, I keep trying to hammer this idea that wine, there are ways to get around things. And I don't mean, it's not the same. It's not Lafitte. It's not, it's not even Bordeaux, but it is a wine where you can say, I'm, I'm tasting something of a pedigree and sort of put yourself in the, in the lane of that stuff, even with the Petite Caro. I mean, obviously, any one of these wines, too, it's not just price, it's age. How old is the bottle? And if you can, if you could probably have one, which I have not had, one that's 10, 20 years old, I bet it would be whitening. I bet it yeah, would be incredible. I would think it would um, age really well. Yeah. Age really well. So what what are the prices on the uh, on the Chilean wines? Do you know, Nicole? Off yeah, Ladi is... Um... $75, um, That's crazy. So they've done yeah. it three times is a $75, $80 bottle. I mean, you can't, if you walk through Napa, just walk down the street, mm-hmm. you're going to, you're going to get hit in the shin by a $110 bottle of wine yeah. or a $150 bottle of wine or a tasting. I won't call out any names, but I would love to. Mm-hmm. I mean, the tastings in winery in wineries in Napa sometimes are 70 bucks, which is just, Stop doing that, everybody. Yeah, stop please it stop. Now. Please stop. For everyone's ridic- sake. <laughs> it's just absolutely, you're killing, you're killing the region from the inside out by doing that. Yeah. But, but, but anyways. I, I do want to touch on the ageability aspect that you guys just talk, talked about. Um, because the current release is the 2018. Um, and they are re-released. They're relaunching the whole label of Lady. So they have this new label that they hired a local photographer to, it's actually right here, this one um to do and relaunch the whole label but part of the relaunch is re-releasing library wine so they're actually going to be releasing the 2010 Lady in limited edition as well um so it, this, this sounds sponsored this is not sponsored, no it's not sponsored at just, all we just we just <laughs> wanted to talk about these wineries in conjunction to like We're talking about the evolution you know. and like re-releasing and ageability um I had another thought on that touch on that note as well but anyways well, I, I, yeah, I, I think I think that's one thing that obviously that is across the board though. I mean, any of these Napa wines we're talking about, any of this stuff, if you can get some age on it, it's completely a much more integrated thing. It's different. Mm-hmm. Very, very, very different. And for some people, different may not be great. For others, it means much better. So mm-hmm. I happen to like aged wine. I think it's um one of the world's great pleasures. You just have to, you know, you have to find it. Mm-hmm. So that's the or have patience, which, you know, when you're when you're doing all the content we're doing, I don't have the luxury of patience. So drinking is a required situation. <laughs> um, so what, when when we talk about this stuff, how do you think they chose these two wineries to become a part of? The Catenas is a pretty easy thing because that's a big wine family. They have a big network. They've got a, a huge level of quality and reputation, but they also make wines that are accessible. How do you think they chose Los Vascos? What, 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 what was it, the reason? Well... <laughs> I'm trying to remember some of the stories that were told through broken English and, and, and just casual, casual conversations. And there was somebody from Lafitte came to Chile to actually look into banking, like a banking investment of some kind. Um, and they looked around for properties for two years before finding Los Vascos. And obviously maybe they were looking for places that were out, openly for sale, or maybe they were looking at opportunities and that weren't for sale and just looking for partnerships, which is, I guess, what happened. But I think the property itself is what they were looking for. They wanted this huge, expansive ecosystem that 
sustainability is a big part of of their identity right now right now and even 25 years ago when they were looking at that i think it was a, a big focus sustainability is one of these one of these topics that i often talk to you know i talked to steve matthias and i talked to many people who've been on the podcast about how do you do that and in a lot of cases people who practice it i know saskia has literally said what i'm about to say it's actually once you get things going it's cheaper it is a it's a much more affordable thing than to use chemicals and use all these other things because the mode of using animals and and regenerative farming and these things are actually it's 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 an interesting topic and it's one thing that I like to keep talking about but I think it's an interesting topic to think that one of the most important wine families in the world push for that. I know that Saskia is of a younger generation and I think right now that is a very important thing to people of her age and that's good. But I also think they've they've been trying that for a long time. So it's not like it's a new concept. Did the Rothschilds bring that down to Chile or was that already in practice? That's a great question. Um, I think I wouldn't be able to say anything with certainty in that regard. Um, I know it's been a focus at Los Vascos for a very long time. They they were sustainable before talks of certification came from Saskia. Um I mean, they had solar panels put in in 2018. I mean, that's almost five years ago. And for a winery like down there, I think that was kind of forward thinking even in 2018. So I wouldn't be able to say if the Rothschilds brought that to Chile. No, but that's a great question. But Nicole, you yeah. said they, they pushed it pretty far, right? With As far as sustainability goes down there at Los Vascos. You said, didn't you say there's some kind of waste? Yeah, so plant, they, like, they go all the way in. They yeah. invested in a, wall, a water um, filtration system, and I, I did ask for dollar figures, and it was two hundred thousand um, dollars about two years ago. And that water system, you can I made a note about it. It's a nine. so it, re- it recycles all of their all their used water, sort of like yeah, and it cleans it so that all? they can use it for irrigation. Mm-hmm. So a good portion of the Ladie vineyards is is irrigated by this water fil- filtration system and then all the other vineyards get um are utilized through their water reserves and the rivers and and all that kind of fun stuff so but this um the solar panels and the water filtration system they are on the road to being 90 percent completely energy um what's the word efficient is that the word yeah yeah Yeah. for sure um which is a pretty big number yeah it really is well so now that we've uh i mean it would be very very fascinating to take a bottle of feet and two bottles you know one from each of these wineries hopefully at the same vintage with a little bit of age Mm -hmm. and blind taste you know somebody on them from a standpoint of not trying to trick them but just the idea of like, can you identify that these wines have a similar character? Mm-hmm. I, Jackson, remember when we walked into Caro, we were mm-hmm. blown away. People were speaking French. It was yeah. like, we we're, we're we've been speaking Spanish for the whole week. And all of a sudden, you know, we were surrounded by people who were, you know, someone's from Lyon and someone's from, it was yeah. just a very yeah. fascinating thing to bring the culture down there. And they, they take their winemakers and their, you know, cellar masters. And it looks to me like there's a very serious amount of quality control that goes into this stuff. Really, yeah. really, 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 and really it, fascinating. It's true. And I mean, they meld it really well, it seems like, because no matter what, you, you know, the land is something you can't change, right? The grapes that are growing on that land, you can't, you can plant different grapes, but the climate's not under your control. So you have all these sort of French practices that they've taken down into Argentina and applied them on, you know, very much this unique soil and landscape that they weren't doing before. So it's amazing that they've done it. And clearly they work really closely with the people there in Mendoza and the Catena family. But, you know, I don't know, to to start from only knowing Bordeaux as a region where you grow wine to then being able to take those principles and apply them to other parts of the world with completely different climates is, it's a fascinating study at least, you know, and to make delicious wine. One of my favorite conversations that I had with Saskia was the idea of the other places they want to go and do wine. 
Nicole, I know that you have heard they want to move into China. Yeah. So, and actually, since I told you that, I they have owned a property there since 2008. They just haven't really done much with it yet. Um, or, I mean, I just am not aware of that, but it is their next their next move for sure to try and figure out all that. So when I talked to Saskia, she mentioned that she would like, and I got to hope I'm not going to get in trouble by saying this, but she was thinking about Ethiopia as a place. I know that they've looked at, there are many wine regions in the world. They probably already own property or are working on it, but there are not many places they haven't, I mean, they were at the forefront of fine wine in Napa, you know, not, not to take anything away from, you know, some of the great historical Napa wines that reached, you know, a price pinnacle or a quality pinnacle, but Opus One is definitely something that put that type of idea in at least the French mind that there is wine and money to be made in the United States from a standpoint of wine production at a high level. And so I wonder if what happened to Opus is going to happen to these two wineries we've discussed. Is it just going to go through the roof? I mean, Opus One, I'd have to look up what it costs. I mean, when I when I made Psalm, Jackson, you made it with me. When I, when we did that, it you could get Opus. I mean, it was a bottle that'd be like, all right, it's not cheap, yeah. but it was not what it is now. I mean, I want to say it was probably 150 bucks back then or something like real. that for a bottle. Yeah, yeah, 150 dollars mm-hmm. is not now. I don't even want to Google what it is. It doesn't. The point yeah. is, is that going to happen to Los Vascos and Bodegas Caro? We're speculating here. I mean, is that going to be? Is this going to be four hundred dollar bottles of wine at some point? I don't get that impression, but never say never. I I don't believe so. I think their production, in terms of Las Vascos, their production is so high in terms of quantities right now that um, I personally don't see it. And I think they want to okay. maintain that attainability as well. Well, they can't do that. Obviously, they can't do that. Let alone Opus One. You, they can't do that in Bordeaux. You know, the land is the land and, you know, it goes back to, you know, Napoleon when it comes down to like the parcels and how it's all that, de- you know, and so they can buy other estates, but Lafitte is Lafitte and that's it. You know, it's not like it's going to continue to grow. So I, that's part of the reason the price has gone so high is the demand has gone high. So if they are making a lot of wine, hopefully that won't happen. And hopefully you guys listening will have a chance to taste these wines. I mean, I don't, you know, I just think it's, really an interesting thing to be able to get into the lane. And that's why I wanted to talk about this stuff is just to try the wines. Any other thoughts on, on, on these two wineries and the, the, the sort of like outlying experience of drinking Rothschild wines? I think I, just I think wanted- it would be really fun. So go ahead. Nicole. <laughs> I wanted to touch more on the dichotomy of like French tradition. And in my case, the Chilean innovation and how they do balance that for the consumer. You know, they still hold on to the centuries of history that the family brings from Bordeaux, but they're very much on the cutting edge of trying new things and exploring new things about their terroir in Chile that is, it's it's exciting, I think, because they're not stuck where they could potentially be with, with the amount of tradition that their name comes with. Um, but there's a lot of exciting things happening, um, from a, from a Chilean perspective and an innovation perspective. Would you recommend wine people who seek wine travel? Mm -hmm. And obviously they have to bring, they have to bring a Vin armor with them (laughs) when they go. But would you, would you recommend that people go to Chile? Absolutely. Is that, uh, yeah. It was not only just beautiful, but it, any wine travel, you gain different perspectives on what wine is, what it represents the people that make it and the heritage of, of that country. I mean, you can't, can't turn that down. Why do you think wine is, see, I, I'm, I'm asking a question that is one of my passions here. Why is wine the great optic to see a country through in your opinion, Nicole? Because of the people I think, and their tradition. And it is such an expression of the land. I mean, not to, to use the word terroir too much, but I mean, <laughs> it is, it's, it's an expression of everything that, that it represents from, you know, tradition and heritage to the people that are actually making it and 
the climate and, and all that fun stuff, that's, that's how you get to know a place. Um, and to be able to drink an expression of that is pretty amazing. Jax, would you recommend people go to Argentina? I didn't yeah. answer here. Yeah, absolutely. hundred <laughs> percent. Yes. Uh, I mean, if you like food, if you like travel, if you like wine, if you like seeing other parts of the world, I would put Argentina very high up on the list of places to go, you know? I mean, I, in touching on the question you asked Nicole, I think, yeah, all the things that Nicole said, I agree with completely. I think using wine as the vessel to take you to places around the world to see new things is a great idea because they tend to be in some of the most beautiful places outside of the grapevine, you know, on the five freeway north of Los Angeles. I can't <laughs> think of another place where they grow vines where it's not beautiful. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that, Argentina, Mendoza in particular, but all up and down. It's, yeah, it's, I mean, I, it's, uh, it's the top five for me as far as food experiences go. Wow. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, and, and for those listening, Jackson has probably been to 20 some 30 countries. I don't even know. Um, and it, I, I remember Chile just to wind this down. I remember Chile. I couldn't get enough seafood. The seafood in so Chile good. is so incredibly outstanding yeah. and you also get to eat all sorts of I, i'll say weird things coming from an american perspective it's really not that weird down there you know percebes and like which are barnacles and mm -hmm. and some huge fish i mean the fish are very large and you you know you get to eat very different things and it's a flip side when you go to argentina and they the i mean we made a whole film called the whole animal yeah. where we went down to argentina and filmed mm -hmm. you know uh, beef and steak and the whole the whole deal and it's uh if you are a foodie i would say that buenos aires and mendoza in particular are like insanely great places to go and this sounds like a luxury podcast we're talking about wines i mean we've mentioned 30 dollars is a bottle mm -hmm. there are wines down in these places that you can get that are criminally underpriced for the value and so it's uh it, it's it's an exciting time when our North Star is Napa and Sonoma, where everybody's clamoring to try to get their wines to 150 bucks a bottle, 100 bucks a bottle, 75 bucks a bottle, where you can actually get wines of the same quality for much, uh, much lower. Mm -hmm. So it is a it is a pleasure to have you two on. And I really appreciate this. This is uh, I want to talk more about where to go because I am hungry to get out of the seat and go see the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks, guys. Everybody, uh, if you're watching this, I hope you enjoyed. If you are not watching this and you're listening to the podcast, we record these. So you can see everything we've talked about if you go to somtv.com, and uh, we hope you do that. All right, everybody, please be safe. We will talk soon.